Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. This lecture is an introduction to incomplete information and kicks off a unit on that very subject. Informational structures are critical in strategic interactions. We've seen a couple of different types of informational structures so far. First, we've seen cases where there is perfect and complete information. These are games where I know everything that has happened previously, and I know what everyone else's payoffs are. An example of this would be anything that we've looked at in the second unit of this course, when we were using backward induction and subgame perfect equilibrium as our solution concepts. A second type of informational structure that we've analyzed is imperfect information, but complete information. These are cases where I don't know what someone else has done before, but I do know what everyone's payoffs are. We actually covered this type of game in the first unit of this course. The Prisoner's Dilemma is an example of this. Imagine that you're player one and I'm player two in a Prisoner's Dilemma. You move first, and then I move after you. But my information is imperfect because I have not observed what you have done when it's my turn to move. I know what your payoffs are, but I don't know what you've done. Now, this is distinct from a third type of informational structure, a situation where there's incomplete information. That is, I don't know what someone else's payoffs are. And there are multiple different situations where we might have incomplete information, but here are a few examples. Imagine that we're in a Battle of the Sexes style game, and I know that you prefer the ballet to the fight to having us not be able to coordinate at all, but I don't know how intense your preference is for the ballet. Maybe you really, really, really prefer the ballet to the fight, or maybe you only slightly prefer your preference is weak for the ballet as compared to going to the fight. That's something that's an internal attribute to you. So I don't know what your payoff is, necessarily. Another example would be in a volunteer's dilemma. We see an accident in the road. Someone needs to call 911 to get help. Well, I don't necessarily know how costly it will be for you to dial 911. Maybe you're really busy with work. Maybe spending two hours with the police doesn't seem particularly attractive to you. Or maybe it's a casual, leisurely day for you, and so you really don't mind spending that time. Again, that's going to be dependent on stuff that's going on in your life and not my life, so I don't necessarily know what's going on in your head and how costly it is for you. A third case might be in a soccer penalty kick situation. If I'm the keeper and you're the striker, I don't necessarily know how accurate you are to your left side versus your right side. You might have some innate ability to be accurate to the left and not be as strong to the right. But that's again something that's internal to you, so unless I've observed you practicing, or we've been playing this over and over and over again so I have a good idea, I can estimate what's going on like that, I don't really know. One thing that's interesting about this third case is that here, my uncertainty about your payoffs, your accuracy to the left versus to the right, actually directly affects my payoffs as well. And that's in contrast to the first two cases. Nevertheless, we can still lump these all together under this incomplete information informational structure. To be clear, these are distinct from situations where there's imperfect information. Again, imperfect information is a situation where I don't know what someone has done previously. And in incomplete information, this is an uncertainty about a preference or a payoff. It's very important not to confuse the two, especially if you want to be a formal theorist, someone who does game theory regularly. Because if you confuse these two things, anyone who does this seriously for a living will know that you're relatively inexperienced with this. That's something that you don't want to signal to other people. You want to signal competence. And so one way of doing that is being sure to know the difference between imperfect and incomplete information. And while we know how to solve games with imperfect information, we actually don't yet know how to solve games with incomplete information. We know how to solve games with imperfect information. We don't know how to solve games with incomplete information. Why can't we yet solve these games with incomplete information? Well, remember that every single solution concept that we've come up with so far has one strategy per actor. But in the types of strategic scenarios that I just gave you, those examples of incomplete information, there are multiple types of actors. For example, with the penalty kick situation, if we have a striker with aim that's better toward the left as opposed to the right, we would think that the types of strikers with that better aim toward the left ought to be aiming that way more frequently. 
in a situation where we're in a volunteer's dilemma and we're thinking about who's going to be calling 911, a type of individual that has a cheaper cost to dial 911 would seemingly ought to be more likely to pick up the phone in an equilibrium setting than those who don't have as cheap of costs. But we can't cover that, we can't analyze that using the equilibrium concepts that we've developed so far because we only have one strategy per actor. And it seems that what we really need is to not only have strategies for actors, but strategies for different types of actors. And that's what we're going to be introducing into this discussion of game theory in this unit on incomplete information. And actually, it's going to be split into two different types of situations, depending upon the timing of a game. So here we see a two by two table of equilibrium concepts. We're very familiar with that top row where our payoffs are complete information. We know that for a simultaneous move game, we have Nash equilibrium. And for a sequential game, we have subgame perfect equilibrium. What we're going to develop in this unit is the analog to Nash equilibrium for incomplete information games. And we call that solution concept Bayesian Nash equilibrium. So individuals will still be moving simultaneously, but there are going to be multiple types of individuals. And we need a solution concept that will cover that. And this Bayesian Nash equilibrium thing will do just that for us. In the unit after this one, we're going to be looking at sequential games with incomplete information. And there we'll be developing the analog to subgame perfect equilibrium, which is perfect Bayesian equilibrium. So that wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time when I talk about what Bayesian-Nash equilibrium is. Take care.